Hi, is this John? Yeah, this is John. All right, we got through to you. That's awesome. Uh, let me do the official introduction. Ooh, okay, sorry, that's my bird. My bird's <laughs> going to be screaming like that every once in a while. That is okay. He's, he's what, kind of of a, crazy. what kind of a bird do you have? I have an eclectus parrot. She sounds gorgeous. Uh, he, he, he's got, he, he is, but he's, he's also got a huge crush on me, so every time I'm, like, touching him, he, <laughs> he starts, to, like, flirting with me. <laughs> I think it's quite appropriate, John, that, you know, considering the character you play in his new movie, I think that character would have a parrot. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, but, but the, the only difference is, is that I, I, this particular bar- parrot that I have is not a South American parrot or a Central American either. He's, a, he's from the Solomon Islands. He's an eclectus all the way from the other side of the world. But they're beautiful birds and they're really crazy and fun. I mean, you know, they're sweet. Right. Really sweet birds. But, but he's, he's, he's a little sexualized right now, so I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to avoid him. Well, you know, considering uh, he swings both ways and considering he has a crush on, a, on an actor, he obviously is a Hollywood bird as well. So, <laughs> Actually, n- not at all. But that, that's okay. He, 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 he's just, you know, he, he's happy with, with 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 whatever way the wind blows. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor with over a hundred and thirty credits to his name. Somebody that you will remember from films like Napoleon Dynamite and The Monster Squad, personal favorites of ours like Joysticks, and so much more. And he's joining us to talk about <laughs> his latest, one of his latest films, All About the Money, by director Blake Freeman. We're very excited to welcome Mr. John Grise to the show. Welcome, you're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Well, thanks, you guys. Thanks for having me. We, we love the film. We're uh, actually a big fan of Blake Freeman because we've had him on the show and I think he's an awesome not only director but great actor and very very funny uh, you go way back yeah he with is him. a funny guy yeah you go way back you actually did noobs with him right that's right that's exactly right so and, it, and funny enough it, the, the funny story about Blake and me is that when he contacted me to do noobs uh, when I first read the script it reminded me a little bit of like films from the same genre as like joystick right and I was I was like ah, do I really want to do this do I want to go back in time and do this again I mean there was a time and place and it was all sweet but do I want to do it again and he got on the phone and he was talking to me and the way he was talking to me I was like dude I, where are you from I mean you, <laughs> you know he, he is he, he's really very straightforward, a really good talker, and I said, either you're a genius or you're a great con man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we had this, and he laughed his ass off. I mean, he was like, no, dude, I like you, I like you. And then, of course, you know, the proof was in the pudding. I mean, he really did, he delivered, and he delivered on this film, too, I think. Uh, really think he did a, did a great job. Well, you know, I, I think he must have really liked you in news because in this new film that you've done with him, all about the money, he spared no expense in your wardrobe. <laughs> yeah, I know a pair of uh, kind of soiled uh, or yellowed tidy whities Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I know it was kind of an interesting way to act in a movie, but you know, listen, I'm I'm the sh- the the show I'm shooting now. I I it's the same kind of thing. I'm shooting a show that it does the same thing. So you know, just the way it is now. You mean in a situation of uh, being basically not dressed very much, or is it more kind of like the same kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. You'd think I'm on a Skinamax show, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm on a uh, I'm on an Adult Swim series called uh, Dream Corp LLC, which is an amazing show. It's really incredible, <laughs> but it is it, it does uh, it pushes all kinds of crazy boundaries. But well, we'll see, being a great character actor and everything, you just basically got to worry about being different, standing out. But obviously, everybody's thinking you're like an Adonis now, so you're having to uh, work out and watch what you eat. And just all of a sudden, at this point in life, they're like, okay, we're going to do. Who thinks I'm Adonis? Uh, you better <laughs> send them my. Their, give me their phone number. I, I don't think I'm Adonis. <laughs> Well, uh, for those that have not had the chance to see All About the Money, uh, can you maybe tell our listeners a little bit about the film, uh, what it's about, and what character you play? Well, the film, in a nutshell, is 
really it's about I mean it's obviously incredibly far fetched but at the same time so funny and it's about four friends who uh, really three friends who decide to uh, ah! they, they've all fallen on hard times you know by virtue of a bunch of circumstances and they decide that the way to get money is to go down to an unnamed South American country and or I think it is I don't know if it's Colombia I don't even know if they even named the country but the, the, to go capture a, uh, a drug kingpin because there's a 20 million dollar reward and so they um, they enlist the um, the services of an expat who lives down there who is a uh, an old soldier of fortune and who lives in his underwear in a church named John Waters, and that's, that's the character that I play. So I, I basically train these guys to be uh, extra hotshot paramilitary, you know. I, I actually am pretty good at what I do, you know, but when you first meet me, you have no clue. You, you think he's absolutely crazy, which he might be a little bit, a little eccentric. <laughs> now, most of, this, most of your scenes, uh, John, was with Blake Friedman. Ah! And also Eddie Griffin. So let us know what was it like on a uh, a day on the set working not only with Blake but also with Eddie. Blake uh, is, is a great actor, but Eddie Griffin strikes me as somebody who improvs a lot and cuts up a lot. Yeah. How much of that was going on? Oh yeah, Eddie. Eddie. Well, I mean, for all for both Blake and 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 you know, look, you know, Blake had the really difficult dual task of being the director as well as being the star of the movie so you know he he had to let things happen and you know yet at the same time guide them you know? right so uh, Eddie's improvisational skills are amazing and he's you know which is great I love that kind of stuff because it's I love to jump right in and and, and play along with it and uh, and Blake you know, right there with us. I mean, it, you know, it just was kind of a a, psycho, a psychological improvisational circle jerk. <laughs> you know, we just one guy did something, and then the next guy did something, and the next guy did something, and, and sometimes rather subtly, but 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 very uh, but but effectively. You know, and but you know, the mo for the most part, we were we were in hysterics all the time. It was hard to keep a straight face, and that's the hardest part. Is not not breaking when you know a take is going really really well, but it, you know if you lose it for a second, you're just going to lose it completely, and you don't want to destroy a great moment. You know, right. so that's that was the challenge, like keep, keeping focus, keeping in, in in character, and not letting it not letting it take you out. You know, now it's supposed to be taking place somewhere in South America. Uh, was it filmed no. there, or was it really California? I had a feeling it might have been California. Yeah, the, the topography is pretty much the same, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, the exception of a few donkeys, you know, it's, like, it's all the same, you know. Now, uh, <laughs> mud huts and donkeys. I guess. No, we shot here in, in, in Southern California. Now, as and we... it's funny because originally, well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but originally when Blake was saying, "Hey, we're going to make this movie." He was like, "Yeah, man, we're we're gonna go down to Central America and shoot this movie." <laughs> and then, uh, you know, every time he'd call me, he's like, "Well, might not be Central America. It might might be out in the <laughs> desert. It might be New Mexico." And then he'd call, me, "No, man, you know, it might be San Diego, <laughs> Tijuana." And, ah, no, I think that's gonna be Santa Clarita. Right over there in LA. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, he started out with some really exotic plans. Like, we're gonna go. You know, we're going to shoot in Aruba. <laughs> so I was like, no, that never happened. Well, see, that's where we differ because, you know, I just saw a movie, uh, the new Goldie Hawn, Amy Schumer movie, and, and they're in, like, South America or something, and I'm thinking, who'd want to go there? I mean, you could really get kidnapped or, or shot or killed or whatever. <laughs> well, sure, sure. I mean, you know, but what, when, when, when I was doing the rundown, they were location scouting P Peter Berg, and, and they went to Venezuela thinking that might be the place to shoot. And they all got hijacked and kidnapped in the, in the jungle as they were doing a location oh. scout. I mean, they, the guys let them go eventually after taking everything, you know, watches and wallets and everything else, wow. and, you know. But, uh, uh, but you know, it was a moment of, uh, 
of sheer terror right. based on what Peter told me. I mean, I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> well, I love your character, okay? Naturally, it is cocky and he's a uh, uh, vigilante and ex uh, special forces and everything. And as, as cocky as he is, he's a little goofy, too. I mean, what did you kind of base that on? Is there any other Whoa. character in a movie that you based it on? Or? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it, sometimes these things, they just hit. It's, I don't know. I don't really know if I ba- based it on anything. I just think that, I think that anybody who drinks their own piss, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that was a big clue for me. It's like, okay, I, I get an I, I got an idea. This you know, this guy's, he's really, uh, you know, he, he means well. He, 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 he's deep in his conviction, which I always like a character who's, who's deeply convicted in what they in what they believe in. Right. He's got a grudge to, to uh, you know, he's, he's a, bit of, a bit of a grudge down there against the drug cartel and, and against the status quo of, of kind of subversive, illegal government, you know. And so... That's always a great foundation, and then you know you add the fact that the guy has just, you know, he's just he's a few. <coughs> uh, sorry, that's the bird. He's that's a few okay. floats short of a parade. I mean, he's just you know he's 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 spun out so much that he's <laughs> he's he's not all there. You know, I and mean, these guys kind of come and bring him back. You know, so it's a symbiotic relationship. It's not like you know uh, he's the guy who teaches them their amazing skills, they also kind of bring him back, you know, he, yeah. he has this sense of reconnecting with humanity a little bit when they, when they, after a little while, you know. Well, I don't know how Blake is as far as if he wants to do something different all the time, but, you know, and I won't give the ending away or whatever, but it was left open-ended in the fact that there was suggestions there might be another one. Did Blake say anything to you that he would like to have a franchise out of this? Oh, I think he. I think he. I think he. I would love to. I mean, I think that was that was definitely in in the cards. That was a plan, you know. And and whether or not that happens, it just it depends on the performance of, of the film, you know. It depends on on how how it does, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but I think that you know Blake is is no fool, and and he also recognizes that. You have to leave every you have to leave every option open for for any any anything when it comes to selling and marketing a film and right. to by 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 um, leaving it open ended it doesn't hurt the film right. at all and yet at the same time it it leaves that option for for another one. Well, I think the film's a lot of fun. Oh, it absolutely! Really one of the things that made it really look like South America was the presence of Danny Trail. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and I know you didn't have any scenes. I don't believe directly with Danny, but did you meet Danny? Was Danny hanging around the set? Oh and, sure, yeah, I met him. Yeah, no, I there was a, a, a. I went and visited the set when they were shooting at the um, the Scarface Mansion, which, ah. as we called it. There's a a mansion in Santa Barbara where they shot Scarface. Uh huh. And uh, we u- we use that mansion as the uh, as the drug as the drug lord's uh, right. you know uh, the main uh, drug lord's place. And uh, whoa, oh, there you go. <laughs> I got so many animals here. What the fuck? <laughs> like a dog. <laughs> All right. Um, so so um, uh, you know, I met him there. And, you know, he's sweet as ever. He's, he's a really cool guy. You know, and his legend proceeds. You know? right, right. Well, I, I would think that maybe he would have done craft services. He's got a great taco place and a donut place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. I, I know. I, 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 you know, he's got an illustrious past. So, yeah. you know, m- there might have been a time in his life where he, he would have knocked over those donut shops with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got to mention. I, I think he would be safe though, because yeah. nowadays, what crook would try to rob Danny Trejo's business? Like, I wouldn't want <laughs> exactly. to. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That that would be the wrong place. To go right. To. Especially, I mean, if he were there. You know? <laughs> I, I, he's definitely a tough-looking guy. Everybody tells me he's really nice, but I'm waiting for an actor Sweet. to say, "Well, he's very sentimental and cries a lot." And. <laughs> and <laughs> You know, I, I, no, I, I didn't, I didn't see that side, of it, but I certainly <laughs> know that he's a very lovely guy, he's a very sweet man. If I can talk just a little bit about some of your other stuff, you, you laugh when I mention joysticks. I'm going to mention something that I don't know if anybody's ever mentioned to you, and we're talking way back, and, and 
let me tell you, you were you were a, a suave mother in that movie. Okay, you were like the the boyfriend and the good looking guy. Uh, I saw Swap Meat last night. Oh no! Terrible, <laughs> terrible movie. I thought okay. it was great. I thought it was a great film. That had to be at. at Did you? It had to be at a drive-in. It's no longer in existence in, in the LA area, right? Well, well, actually, there was a, there was a, there. Were, I had a, I had a, a, a kind of a bang-up year, a, a couple like two years in a row when Swap Meet. There was a, a theater on Sunset Boulevard down near Gower, which is now torn down and yeah. it's just turned into a parking lot. But it, and I had a fantasy for years of buying this theater and turning it into a concert venue, but you know, couldn't couldn't earn enough money to do it, but. But nonetheless, it was called the world. It was a, it was the ninety nine cent you know come and see as many shows as you like and sit in the theater and fall asleep if you want you know one of those kind of theaters. And I had three films premiere there <laughs> in uh, in two years. One of them was Swap Meet. The next one was a film called Sunny Side with Joey Travolta, and then Joy Six. <laughs> and I think after those three films came out, I was like. I kind of felt like, all right, I'm I'm doomed to be like you know, the combination of Bela Lugosi and Ed Wood without ever <laughs> even being Dracula, you know. I mean, I just I felt like I, I was I, I, my I, my career was pretty much that was that was it. I was I hit the, the peak and that was all that was going to happen. And I was you know, I, I wasn't exactly happy about all of them at the time. You know, I was trying to I, I wanted to be Robert De Niro or something. You know? Yeah. Well, you definitely had the look. I, I mean, you were a good-looking dude back then. You're a good-looking dude now, but, I mean, you had great hair. You know, I mean, it was I great know. I ha- I, you mean I had hair. You, say it. Okay. you had hair. Now That's- he's a wig actor. <laughs> Although I, 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 don't, I didn't have hair in, 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 uh, in what I call Mucho De Niro, which is what the name of All About the Money was called when yeah. we originally were shooting it. It was called Mucho De Niro. Yeah, but um, which I love the title actually, all about the money. I think it's a good title. It's a well, you don't have to worry about the hair because you're going for the physique. Yes. In in you know all about the money because <laughs> you know you're wearing the the tidy whiteies and everything. That's all good. Now, as we go through the interview, John, I am having uh, listeners that are submitting questions and things like that through email and social media. And uh, one of the listeners said, uh, "Can you please ask John uh, how old he was when he did his first role? Because I believe it was." In in a film his father directed. It's a true story. Yeah, I, I was I was eight eight years old in a film called Will Penny, and uh, it was with Charlton Heston and and Ben Johnson and Bruce Dern and Joan Hackett. And uh, it's a very I bear the truncated version of the story was my father never in in a million years would have wanted me to be in this movie. It just so happened that I had knocked my tooth out. And we had just moved out to L.A. from New York, and he rented a house by the beach, and he had to take me to the dentist to have my tooth, uh, a, a fake tooth put on my, you know, or I fitted for a fake tooth, right. you know. And, uh, and he didn't want to take me all the way back out to the beach, so he took me to the studio with him, and I got to miss a day of school, and basically he, he couldn't be bothered with me because he had to get a draft of the script in by the end of the day. So he just told me to go wander around on the Western Street. It was at the Paramount lot. So I just was walking out of the main building and in walks these two guys and they just happened to be the producers of the film and they pulled me into their office and they started chatting with me and of course they figured out that I was his son and then they kind of played a joke on him and said, hey, we got the kid. And he, you know, I could hear him <laughs> through the wall going, oh, great. He comes running in and he was like, he looked at me and he just basically said, he's not an actor, he's an idiot. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, that was kind of his humor. And uh, uh, But anyway, they convinced him to screen test me and I guess there was something that was not polished in whatever I did because I certainly wasn't polished and and I, I won the part over. So, you know, I got offered a lot of movies after that and I decided because I, I had, you know, I got three older brothers were all kind of kicking my ass and I was like they were like oh the actor mm. <laughs> you know they, they were giving me a hard time so I turned down the Cowboys with John Wayne I oh. turned down the Reavers with Steve McQueen I turned down Bless the Beast and the Children I turned down a lot of movies uh, because I just decided I wasn't going to be an actor and then you know later on when I got a little older I, I, I came back to it 
Now, when you got a little older and decided to come back to it, what made you decide to want to go back to acting? Because your family, from what I've read, you kind of had a little bit of everything from the entertainment industry. I mean, your dad was a director. I believe I read your mom was an actor. And your grandfather was a jazz pianist, right? Well, my grandfather was actually a coronet coronetist. He was a jazz coronetist. His name was Muggsy Spanier. Mm-hmm. And he was... Uh, my my real grandfather left my grandmother when my father was five years old. I never met my real grandfather. She remarried the jazz trumpetist, and she was basically his road manager. So they went on world, you know, tours. I mean, he played with everybody. He played with, you know, uh, Bing Crosby's brother. He was Bob Crosby's band leader. He was also played with Duke Ellington. He was in his band for a while. He played. He was very good friends with Louis Armstrong. They both played together a lot. So it was. A, they both played the same style of music. You know. And so, um, so yeah, he he, um, he he was very well known in his day, you know. And um, and my uncle was was a jazz pianist, and, and uh, my that's you know my father's brother. So yeah, a lot of different different aspects of entertainment. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned that part about turning down those roles, and it was for a different reason back then uh, than what it is now. Because you turn down roles now because you don't think that would be something good for your career but I flippantly made a joke because you got so many credits I was like does he do everything that's offered to him and Tiffany who's my daughter the other host said no he turns a lot down and I guess you got a lot of offers you turned down because you thought they were stupid because they were rip offs of Napoleon Napoleon died well yeah the, 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 that's true the, the, you know basically I mean there's that there is this kind of element in Hollywood, any actor who does a role that some becomes even remotely iconic, it seems like everybody crawls out of the woodwork, writes similar roles when they're writing their 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 grand, you know, uh, masterpiece, mm-hmm. and and they want you to come in and kind of recreate Uncle Rico or whomever, Laszlo, you know, Hollyfeld as a little different you know and and quite honestly you know those are the ones that i'm like you know you gotta be kidding me come on i mean i did it it's been done i've done it it's over i don't want to come back and do that guy i i you know i I don't want to come back and imitate something that i've done you know yeah um it's bad it's it's hard enough you know it's hard enough to try and keep everything as fresh as you possibly can i mean i even get sick of myself so <laughs> well, you know i i don't I, I love your characters and i think of you maybe i'm wrong because i know you can play anything uh but i think of quirky characters a lot like another one i respect is crispin glover and his characters are all quirky do you kind of even though you want different stuff do you kind of look for quirky characters i mean do you think that they're the ones that really stand out on a screen not at all. No, no, no. I, I recently, you know, I, I recently turned a film down that I look back on. I, I you know, this is probably tales out of school. I, I got offered a film that I love the character, and it was not a quirky character. He was an ex, uh, you know, uh, uh, military guy who ends up becoming, getting in, enlisted by a prostitute to protect her. Mm-hmm. As she as she it goes out and does her job and and you know there's a lot of amazing things that happen and then he ends up having it becomes a revenge film but there was something so beautiful about the way it was written and so beautiful the character was so beautifully crafted and it was my you know there were certain elements of my representation and things that said look you can't do these movies that don't pay right. anything anymore you've got to like step up a bit. And, and because they just didn't have I mean I, it wasn't even going to cover my bills you know to go shoot this for a month so you know I, I finally had to bow out but I, I will tell you the role usually does for the most case, part supersede and trump whatever the money is whatever if it's a good enough role and if it's a well enough written script I want to do it you know yeah. I, I want to do it and I want to do the character and I still regret that I turned that one down and this was like eight months ago nine months ago you know um just because i loved the character and he was not quirky he was actually more sullen uh um, uh, um you know just a, uh, obviously a lot of brooding and a little darker and 
I mean, I, I, these are all generalities because I, I, I didn't really investigate where I would go with the character. It's, it's a lot more specific, but mm -hmm. but it, it, the template was there, and I, I I you know was interested in doing it, but I didn't end up doing it. I don't know why I'm talking about a film I didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> well, in talking about uh, as we were talking about Napoleon Dynamite earlier, we have another uh, question from our audience. Uh, this one is from okay. Colin, and he says, uh, "How did?" John find out about Napoleon and did anybody have any idea that the movie was going to take off the way that it did it was such a small film and such an underdog but it had enormous success and broad appeal well I don't think anyone could, could have predicted what what it was what was going to happen with that film although I was I was pretty certain that the film was going to have of success I, I just had that feeling um, when we were shooting it, I, con I actually contacted a couple of a couple of distributors that I know that I've dealt with in the past with other films that I've been involved in, and and I I was trying to get them an inside track, and and you know one of them didn't return my call, and she later on told me how she will never not she will never do that again <laughs> because she missed she missed an opportunity to get on that on board with that film, but. It landed where it landed, and it had, that's where it had to be. I mean, I don't think anybody else would have quite brought that film out the way Fox Searchlight did. They, uh -huh. they're, the, they're still, to me, the best uh, film distributors and, and the most creative with their uh, ad campaigns and, and, and the most um, diligent. You know, they just keep at it. They keep at it. Now, with respect to the, the film itself, I, I, was, I had done a film called The Big Empty, with uh, John Favreau, and I um, uh, basically, you know, the, the guys from Napoleon Dynamite came to Los Angeles, and they didn't have an office or anything like that. You know, they barely had any money. And the guy who cast this film, The Big Empty, a guy named Jory White, was cast was the casting director on, on Napoleon Dynamite, and they had put offers out um, for the character of Uncle Rico to a few people, that, and they all turned it down. And so. Uh, mainly, I'm sure, because of the money. I'm sure they didn't even read the script. And Jory said, hey, by the way, we're using the office of, of the editors for this film called The Big Empty, and John Grise is in this film, and he's pretty funny, and you should take a look at it. And so they looked at my footage, and then they just said, let's make an offer. So they sent me the script. And, of course, representation being the way representation mm -hmm. is, they were like my manager at that time it was a different manager than I'm with now and he was don't do this movie they have no money I don't I, I think you should be insulted you know he was he got all up in a tizzy over and I was like what this let me read the script and by page 15 I was laughing out loud and I said I just called him back and said you tell them I'll, I'll show up wherever they want me to show up and I'll drive there and that's what I did I drove to Idaho <laughs> I wow. did a movie with him well you know in talking to you I can tell you're a very smart guy and you put a lot of thought in what you do, but I also know you're very loyal, and I don't know what part of you uh, took place in the thought process of this. And, and don't get me wrong in asking this. I don't want you to think I'm knocking it because I enjoyed it. It was good. I'm a major Napoleon Dynamite fan, but I really felt doing the animated series was a mistake. Uh, I don't know. How do you feel yeah. about it going in? It wound up not doing too well. Was it loyalty that you did it, or...? Well, I think that, you know, the, the fact is is that Fox uh, was very uh, adamant about doing a sequel. And we all agreed, uh, no, we didn't want to do a sequel. Um, we didn't want to feel like we were winking at the audience and saying, hey, check us out now. <laughs> you know, we didn't want to be aware of ourselves to the point that, that we were, you know, uh, uh, you know tongue-in-cheek and, and, you know, patting ourselves on the back because I find that sometimes when sequels come back they have that, that there's a sensibility about them that and almost like every sequel they need to be even more humble and more fresh and more original and not rely on any any of the old stuff because the minute you start throwing that stuff around I, I think that then all of a sudden you're kind of leaning you're leaning on something now granted I know people are seeing it because they want to see those things but just I just think it has to come from a, an, a, an incredibly genuine place. When right. when the cartoon uh, idea came along, it was it was it was yes, it was experimental in the sense that 
we wanted to do it because we could actually then take it further and, and make make it stupid, you know, mm-hmm. like more stupid. We we could, you know, have bed races, you know, like that one episode where they were having bed races in the downtown, <laughs> right. you know, just just things that otherwise would would it would have been prohibitive to shoot unless you had a you know a huge budget, you know. I mean, and, and just kind of crazy and quirky stuff and and we did that you know I, I don't know if we any of us were, were certain that the the, the film was going to be um, I mean the uh, cartoon was going to be a hit right. but you know I, I, I don't know in retrospect I still I feel I never felt comfortable doing it I'd be honest with you I, I never did I I never felt like I um, you know, I never felt like I uh, did Uncle Rico the way I I knew him to be when I played the character in the film. I felt like the direction that I got all the time in the cartoon was to be really loud. Right. And I and I never liked it, and I never felt I, I felt like it it had no subtlety. It killed all subtlety. You know, I tried. I kept fighting for that subtlety, and I I I couldn't find it. You know. And so, yeah. So for me, there was a. It was uncomfortable, you know. But uh, I didn't know that going in. I thought we were going to try and, and, you know, bring back that that the qualities that we had in that in that show in that film that we. I don't think we were even able to remotely achieve on the cartoon, you know. Right. Uh, another uh, film that a lot of listeners are asking me to ask you about, I'm sure you get asked about all the time, uh, is The Monster Squad. Um, and something that I did not know until just recently is I did not know that you did not play the full makeup werewolf. No, I didn't. I, di- I didn't, yeah. And, and, it, and, and it angered me when we were doing it. It made me angry because I felt that the guy who was playing the werewolf, uh, the idea that Fred Decker wanted to have the guy <clears throat> much, <clears throat> excuse me, physically larger, mm-hmm. and and I understand that as a choice, but uh, unfortunately, uh, they just put a stuntman, uh, and not to say that stuntmen cannot act, cannot act, but mm-hmm. I, I felt like this this particular guy didn't just didn't understand nuance. And he played it kind of, uh, you know, on a on a note that that didn't make me happy. I, I wanted, I you know, I, because I felt like people were going to think that that's me, you know, right. in in that in that in, <clears throat> as that character. And I don't know, I I, wa- I wasn't happy with it, you know, and because of that, I, there was a few things that I I don't think I was too terribly happy with in that movie. Although I did like the movie quite a bit, you know, I, I thought I, it was- I, I was never a huge fan of my work. It was yeah. definitely better than the Goonies, that's for sure. But I, I read that you had said, uh, you know, that, that you're never one to ever knock anybody that's an actor. Of course, a stuntman's an actor, too. But you didn't like the way he just had his arms up in the air and went, raw all the time. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I felt like, you know, I, I felt like, and I, would, and I would go to the director and say, hey, listen, come on, try and get this guy to do something. Because, I, 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 you know, this is not a carnival thrill ride. I, I, I don't even know who, who the stuntman is or was. I, I didn't really, I don't, I mean, I might have met him on the set, but I, I you know, I, I hope he doesn't take offense to this, but it just was the way that I, that I interpreted the character when I was working on the script was different than the way that the character was played. And I, I just didn't, I just thought it, it was a little too straightforward and simplified. And who knows, maybe, maybe there's genius in that, but just for me, it didn't work. Yeah. I can't recall which came first, which film, but you got a chance to play a werewolf in another film, and that's Fright Night Two. Did you get to do the makeup there? Oh, I, oh, I, I mean, I mean, I didn't do the makeup. That was Greg Cannon who did the makeup. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I was the, I was the werewolf. In yeah, that one. yeah, that's yeah, what I, I meant. I, sure. I, well, basically, I was a vampire who became a wolf. Yeah. So. You know, um, but but it, 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 a wolf nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting and that was after uh, uh, um, um, Monster Squad. There you go. Uh, for your career, John. I mean, it's so interesting if you look because, it, and I'm sure you probably get this when you talk to fans. You 
have so many different facets of career, your career. I mean, I'm sure you'll have fans that are fans of stuff like the Monster Squad and Fright Night 2, and then you have people that are fans of stuff like Joysticks and Terror Vision Lost. and stuff like that. And then you have people that are fans of Lost and the Taken films. What is, if you had to name comedy versus drama or just pick a couple of projects that you were the most proud of, what yeah. do you like being recognized the most for? Well, I would definitely say Real Genius. Uh, I think Real Genius um, is a great film, and I, and I, it's amazing. We just did the, I guess, the 35-year or 32, 30-year anniversary. We, we showed it at USC, and it was all uh, packed with students most of whom ne had never seen the film and they were laughing out loud it, the film held up beautifully even though uh, technologically it, it didn't have the same uh, you know it didn't have the, the kind of stuff that these that the gen that this generation is used to I mean obviously the animation was crappy you know or, or whatever you know the, uh, compared to the stuff today but but the, the humor and and the um, and the sentiment and the style of it was so beautifully done and and still holds up really well today that right. film i would say napoleon dynamite um there are uh films that i've played characters like i do uh i, I do like the character john waters a lot in all about the money i was very happy with how that turned out you know i i don't usually like to watch myself but if i can watch myself and laugh um you know like god what an idiot! You know, like that. Kind of thing. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I've done okay. You know, um, and I, I love, really, really feel like everything that I've done has led to where I am right now, which is doing this, this Adult Swim show called Dream Corp LLC, and it, it's it's an amazing show. And we've only we only had six episodes show last season. We just finished fourteen, and. Um, I just think this show could kind of take the world a little bit by storm. It's so interesting and so uh, so uh, complete in my uh, in my the way I feel about it. And I just do. I think I'm. I, I feel like I'm on one of the best shows on television. And it's only eleven and a half minutes long each episode. Well, you know, we have an awful lot of Adult Swim fans here at the radio station. Oh yeah. What's what's the uh, show about? Well, it, it's a it's about a doctor whom I play named Doctor Roberts, and he has a facility called Dream Corp LLC. He's kind of a fallen angel from the the dot com boom, and he has this technology where he can go into people's dreams and join them in their dreams and guide them through all their problems and get to whatever the root of whatever they're dealing with, whatever their issue is, mm -hmm. and and fix it. And of course, it, it's not, it's so much easier said than done. I mean, it leads to a lot of chaos and craziness. The cast is amazing. And the, the showrunner slash director of every episode slash creator slash writer, Daniel Sesson, is, uh, is really, I would say, you know, he's on par with Jodorowsky or, or uh, Kubrick. He's on his way there. He's got that mind. He has this mind and it's, quite intense and quite incredible and that's why I think John Krasinski and, and Stephen Merchant jumped on board and said hey we want to see this show get made and, and, and walked it into Adult Swim and Adult yeah. Swim said yes let's do it you know wow. and I you think were... whatever we've done up, up to this point the first six episodes which I love I, this, this new season is way far and above I've got to mention one more crazy film, if I may, before we let you go here. Uh, sure, this sure. kind of has a history with this radio station. Uh, a young lady that played your girlfriend in this movie, she actually worked for this radio station. She did five shows here in a, a series <clears throat> kind of based on a book she put out. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's uh, Diane Franklin. You did Terror Vision. Oh, yeah. And I've got to tell you, the reason I'm bringing it up it is because I'm a big Mary Warnoff fan. <laughs> She's like the, the oh, yeah. B-movie driving her. queen. She told us that she thought your character and, and the way you portrayed it was genius. And, and that was like her favorite character from the movie is O.D. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. So that's like the ultimate compliment coming from the queen of all uh, <laughs> low budget cinema. But but that, you that, know what? You're you're absolutely right, and and you just made my week because hearing that. First off, I'm a huge fan of Mary Warren. Oh, and, all right. Uh, and so. So to hear that she actually said that about me is, uh, you know, that that's that's high high praise. That makes me very. That's like, to me, that's rarefied air, because I know that she's not, she's not, uh, you know, she's a, a an amazing artist. Yes, you know, she she's is. an amazing creative person, and she does not suffer fools. No. So that uh, makes me. That, that really makes me feel happy. That's wonderful. Absolutely. Well, we want to uh, have all of our listeners make sure that they head out and check out the film All About the Money. Um, of yeah. course, the film stars uh, John Grise, of course, Blake as Freeman. well as Blake Freeman, Eddie Griffin, yep. Casper Van Dien, Danny Trejo, Lynn Shea's in there. Everybody is in there. Uh, the film is now in theaters uh, and on demand as of yesterday, June 2nd. So check it out, All About yeah. the Money. And, uh, John, where should fans go, if anywhere online, to keep up to date with you? Do you have a Facebook, a Twitter, a website, anything like that? I, 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 I only, at this point, I only have a Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> uh, it's John Grimes. Uh, and um, uh, what else? I was going to say, oh, Lynn Shea. She's amazing. Oh, yeah. I love her. I directed a film called Pickin' and Grinning. And, um, gosh, she was so wonderful in the film. And it was it was horrible because I had to cut her out, and I had to cut her out not because she 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 was wonderful. It 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 was it, the scene fell at a place in the film that it was it slowed the pace of the movie. It just happened to be, you know, and and so I called her and said, Lynn, I got wonderful news and terrible news. The wonderful news is we're going to shoot another scene. The terrible news is I got to cut the scene we uh -huh. shot. We went and shot another scene, and I put it in, and then I had to cut that one too. <laughs> and I, 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 I remember calling her saying, "I'm on my knees, and I'm so sorry because the work, because she's so good. She's oh, yeah. such a good actor. She's got <laughs> such a good sense of humor too. She was just voted by this major national horror publication. They voted Lynn Shay as the grandmother of horror. <laughs> and you would think she'd be offended, oh, but yeah. she thought it was great. She, we, lo she's been on oh, the show. No, we love yeah. her. Wonderful. I think she's sexy. I really do. She's the sexiest <laughs> actress going nowadays. But. Oh, she's 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 really incredible. She's well, incredible. I, she's, I hope. Uh, I think she can do anything. Yes. That's the thing about her. I really think she can do anything. And you know, she like you, John, is one of those actors who is out there and they're doing the big budget films and they're co-starring with major celebrities like you have but then you guys also give the newcomer independent director a chance to work with you guys as well and I know and I've talked to quite a few indie directors and that means so much to them it gives them a chance to get noticed yeah well I, I, I appreciate that but I do I do feel like um you know, if you're going to do this, and you, 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 I think it's okay to give back. And I don't, I don't, I, I think that, you know, under that, under that auspice, you know, you're, you're, you're ultimately doing a better thing. Yeah, it might not be the best thing for your career, but if, if you're going to, if you approach it with the same integrity, now granted, I mean, if somebody writes me and says, hey, I've got this amazing script and I don't like it, or I don't like the part, or I think the part is cliche, you know, I mean, I still, I'm not going to do anything. I, I still will say, as you mentioned, I say no a lot. Course, I do, yeah. I do, no question. But um, I know I rambled today a lot, by the way. I, I, I actually worked till 6 in the morning, and oh. I, I didn't sleep. I just stayed awake. <laughs> so. Oh, I, I, I've been up all. I've been up. I don't know since when. What day is it today? It's Saturday. It's Saturday. I've been up since ye yesterday at six a.m. So I, I'm like, no, you did. I'm in another. You did great, John. But one more question before we go from the audience. The listeners want to know what is John's bird's name? Picasso. Picasso. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Well, that bird's a star. He needs to be in the next film. <laughs> Well, you know, I tell you, we had another one named named Eggs, and she was amazing. And unfortunately, she got sick last August. Oh. We only adopted Picasso 
two years ago from an elderly woman who couldn't take care of him anymore to be with this other bird and then she passed away so now we have Picasso and he's amazing and I'll tell you birds really just belong in the wild but if, if it's you know what are you going to do if they're domesticated you just take over and, and try and make their life good you know they, re they really do fall in love with you too and they sit at the, the supper table with you and they're part of the family and they're almost oh, yeah, like yeah. a dog <laughs> that's crazy well, as we wrap I this take up... This, we take this guy to restaurants, and he comes and eats with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we wrap this up, again, I want to remind our listeners, uh, first of all, make sure to check out Dream Core LLC, uh, part of Adult Swim, and then, of course, All About the Money, available in theaters and on demand as of June 2nd. John, thank you so much for spending some time with us, and please go get some rest. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, so nice talking to you guys. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your weekend. You too. All right. Bye.